hello and greetings to all. Uh, my name is Gavin Finley. Today I have with me Gianluca Moratti from Forley, Italy, um, who has written a wonderful book on the uh, restoration of Israel, which goes into depths which we are not used to seeing or hearing. So it's a very wonderful, um, deeper study into how God is going to wrap things up at the close of the age. So Gianluca, welcome. And uh, it looks like it's going to be a wonderful conversation today as we look at the, as we come towards the climax, this is session number 11. So we're coming towards some climactic uh, events in the, I guess you'd call it the wrestling of Jacob. Um, uh, as we come into the close of the age, why things have to be that way and how God's love is, uh, is profoundly present through, uh, through it all. And uh, over, he is overseeing it all and, his intentions are to bring his people closer to himself. So that's uh, going to be a, a great conversation, John Lucas. So uh, you can proceed and uh, God speed to us on this little, this little piece of information as we come to the end of the age. A lot of people are not used to hearing it. So we do encourage you to be prayerful and to, uh, to look to the Lord as you hear the scriptures uh, presented here today. Well, Gavin, it really uh, amazed me how the Lord has put us together for this long journey. It looks like a never-ending never story, uh, mm -hmm. but this is the way of the pilgrims, uh, and uh, we are considering many things. So once again, it's very good to be with you today and uh, with our viewers for, as you said, the 11th part. We are going to touch on the prophetic sequence of the events before the wrapping up of all things, uh, uh, perhaps uh, next time, should the Lord allow us again to record and uh, end with this uh, restoration of Israel. For those that have uh, followed all the uh, conversations, um, we have shared many, many, many things. Well, first of all, we we've been considering that uh, the last phase of the so-called pilgrimage, the ascent from the uh, natural progressive to the spiritual culminate, culminates with this, with the unveiling of Yeshua mm -hmm. to the house of Jacob. The unveiling is unto salvation for the house of Jacob. And we have reached the climax with this last time of the phases of the pilgrimage so far examined. So, Aliyah to Yeshua, as I have defined it, uh, is the final manifestation of the call of the house of Jacob, the house of Judah, the Jewish house to a holy pilgrimage, uh, which once again, I want to repeat, is not holy per se, but it becomes holy at final destination. So it's a progressive ascent from the natural to the spiritual. This is a wonderful scripture taken from Zechariah 12 and 10. And we have also learned that it's a common salvation, Gavin. When mm -hmm. Yeshua died, he died for both. He died for the Jews. He died for us in the nations. And it is precisely at the cross that he has abolished what? The enmity, mm -hmm. thus making peace between the two. There are no barriers for God. Those he gives a new what citizenship in his greater Israel. God is always for unity. We have learned he's never for disunity Absolutely. in what he calls the Commonwealth of Israel. Mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to understand it, to see even there are um, a passage of scriptures that we can meditate on the Old Testament in the Old Testament where God sees these people as a whole company. Even uh, at the time when the so-called United Kingdom uh, split into two, we know the story, the north and the south, uh, uh, the, the split and of Jeroboam. And uh, we have, a, for example, a testimony during the time of Hezekiah. We read in Second Chronicles uh, 29 and 30. For example, here we have two instances where uh, we see that sacrifices twice here are made for all Israel and Ezekiah he sends runners throughout the the land from from Judah and Jerusalem throughout the land of Israel trying to get as many people as possible to come and to uh, 
um, partake all together in the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which at the time of Hezekiah, they, they did it in the second months, because I think that the scripture says that there were not enough priests that were uh, consecrated for the service. So even uh, at the peak of their division, Gavin, we have instances in which God sees them as one. This is, for me, absolutely amazing. And, and soon after, a decree is sent, as I said, from Jerusalem throughout Judah uh, by Hezekiah to call all the people of Israel. We read uh, later on here in Second Chronicles 30, 18 and 19, that may the Lord God provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers. Isn't that amazing? That Atonement, yes. once again, mm. is provided uh, to unite even two kingdoms that were at odds between them, of course, yeah. because of sin. But they wanted, you know, to go their way. But God sees all the people as one. Yes, that's that's a wonderful uh, uniting uh, uh, theme, the matter of atonement, John Luca, we, we in the uh, church, uh, in, the, in, the, in the West, in, in, in the nations that hide the lost house of Israel, we are focused upon the salvation of God and being born again and uh, the new covenant uh, in that way. But we don't think too much about the, uh, how the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross uh, his bloodshed there is an atonement that links to the Jewish or Hebraic uh, feasts of Israel, prominent uh, amongst them being the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, and it, it is the uniting theme because God wants us to be saved, and he has provided his blood of atonement. And we in the church are not inclined to focus too much on that. We want to think in terms of of the golden rule and being a good person and the good, the good things outweighing the bad things. And we hope that we will be okay with God, but the issue of atonement uh, about the blood sacrifice about us committing to him who made his commitment to us fully, that uh, matter is something that we in the church need to move on towards, even as our Jewish friends who also are substantially not saved, uh, need to come to understand that there is an atonement that needs to be um, um, discovered by them because in their Yom Kippur services, they're not really focusing on, on how that atonement is made, are they? Because the sacrifices are no longer there. The temple was destroyed uh, by the Romans in 70 AD. Uh, they were scattered, and they've got the synagogues. Uh, they remember the Day of Atonement, but they are not really focused on how the sacrificed lamb, the blood of, of the lamb, uh, is going to provide that atonement. Which lamb? Is it the other lambs and bulls of days gone by or the, or that are show and tells of the ultimate sacrificed lamb, or is it um, dreaded thought? The, the blood of Messiah. So, so uh, th they are having to come to a point of uh, come to Jesus meeting. We in the church have to come to uh, come to Jesus meeting too, because we can't just say, "Oh, well, you know, I'm, I've been a good person." You know, or in the British in the British uh, Commonwealth, they said the, the vicar used to say, "Our Lord," as if to say, "Look, we've got it all covered." You know, you're a British citizen, then our Lord, uh, yeah, he'll take care of you. But how? through the blood of atonement. Uh, do you know the God who provides atonement? Do you know him personally? Have you brought him into your, into your hearts in the new covenant? And that's, that is the lesson for both houses of Israel. And atonement is how things are wrapped up at the close of the age. It's probably the last day. So. Oh, absolutely. The point is, there is a lamb that died for all the congregation. We can't get away with this. Yeah. He died for the United Kingdom that was already divided because in, in his sight, he, he sees one. And yes. Yes. there's ample testimony, even in this, as I said before, it, during the, the time of the split that 
lasted for, for many years in Israel and, and in Judah. Uh, um, the attempt of godly uh, kings like Hezekiah and uh, afterwards Josiah, Josiah hmm. uh, yeah. was for the unification, even after Hezekiah, uh, during the time of Josiah, when he hmm. found the book of the, of the law, the Torah, and uh, they repented and they turned to God. And then uh, afterwards, they united together. They did uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread together. And uh, with all the people that even came from the various tribes of the north, mm -hmm. because God sees them one. So the atonement is for the, the, the whole company, the whole group of people, yes. uh, which we have in in, in Ephesians chapter 2, which is called also not only the commonwealth of Israel, but also the household of God. Mm. And so God so, is always for unity. So these were, these were some kings in the house of Judah who were reaching out to the northern tribes who had rebelled and saying, come back, come back to, the, um, to look at the God of Israel and seeing his feasts who are which are basically show and tells of God's agenda for restoration, uh, atonement. Um, uh, uh, he was the, he was a sacrificed lamb. He he was the unleavened bread of heaven. He was the first fruits from the dead. He sent the Holy Spirit. So uh, he, Messiah and his first coming fulfilled those first four. So we 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 in the uh, in the feasts are starting to see that God has an agenda that's unfolding. Boom, 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 boom. All seven yeah. uh, will wrap things up. So he's laid it out very beautifully for us. And uh, there are some mysteries about the four feasts, which uh, we have an opportunity to, to study and to meditate on, to ponder and to ask the Lord to show us. And uh, I believe he will, if we take responsibility for the latter days, that is, which seems to be a, a big issue. Uh, because God can't really trust people who say, look, we're not going to be here for the latter day issues. So why should God give information to people who are not going to be responsible in those final seven years and say, we're out of here. Why should he give them information? Well, um, that's, that's because we're in a spiritual war and uh, we we're given information on, as you said, in one of the previous sessions, John Luke, on a need to know basis. So, um, we are on a pilgrimage and we learn as we go. So this is very wonderful. Oh, absolutely. God is always for unity. Anytime we see something, entities, whatever, man or, or like, you know, governing angels in, in the second heaven, uh, trying to uh, bring disunity, we know what we are talking about. It's a spiritual yes, yes. warfare. And, and today we see in the world that there is this much uh, bigger attempt to bring uh, all to a one world government, which is completely mm -hmm. different to what Yeshua wants to do. Yeshua wants to, to unite people uh, under his government, which is the godly government. Yeah. Uh, and you can see you can see what the big drama is going to be in the latter days, John Luca, yeah, because yeah. you've got you've got uh, what we've had 1700 years in which uh, uh, after the Council of Nicaea, the uh, Constantine said, look, come and you come into the you Christian believers in the church, come in and I will I will make a deal with you. You will have to make some uh, some uh, allegiance to the princes of Europe, but we are going to install you as as our religion. So it became church and state. And we've had some good things and some bad things as a result yeah. of that for the last 1700 years. But as we look at the new world order to come, we can see that uh, it's no longer a garden country. It's no longer a church and state. It's just yeah. state or, Absolutely. or new world order under the, the beast of Daniel chapter seven, which who doesn't look very holy, does he? <laughs> so um, we're, we're looking at a situation where God is then saying, okay, um, Whose side are you on here? It's like the Mount Jerusalem thing. Uh, choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the God of life? Yeah. Or are you going yeah. to serve the God of death? Yeah. So are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? Are you going to choose truth or are you going to choose lies? We see now with our culture that people don't particularly care about truth. And, and if the foundations are destroyed, what can, what can the righteous do? Okay, we're coming into the end time crisis right there. So 
that's, I think, where you're headed uh, in the next section here, John Luca, right? No, absolutely, yes. You said very well, Gavin, that uh, during the course of history, there have been there has been both good and, and bad attempts of unification, but they all point to the the the, the master unification of let's say of the two houses uh, of uh, you know both uh, let's say entities that are not entities per se, but in the mind of God, uh, the Lord is seen as all together in, in, as we will be in the New Jerusalem. So mm. is the church, so is the, the royal house of Judah uh, coming together and there will be more and more. I think there were even some attempts in Israel that um, they prefigure what is going on in, in, uh, in the spiritual realm. Did you remember Cromwell? In England, or Oliver uh, Cromwell? Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, I think, um, well, there's, there's two things. I, I think God wants to unite. God wants to unite yes. his people. And also Nimrod wanted to unite under the Tower of Babel too, right? So, oh, so there's, a, there's an impetus to unite both by the powers of darkness and by God. So both God and the powers of darkness have this common desire to bring all people together. Okay, um, who who's it going to be? Are you going to come to together to Messiah or are you going to come together to the anti-Messiah? So that'll be the yeah, big we, drama. We, but, we, uh, had, we had also, let, let alone in Italy in 1830, Massini. Oh, uh, yes, in, yes. The head of the Italian revolutionary movement, which, which was called the Young Italy. You know, that was the aim of uniting the country. Yeah, so we know yeah. that underneath there was a kind of like a deep thing, you know. But mm -hmm. we, we, we need to uh, to look to the Lord, to look what he's doing, to look at his efforts of uniting mm. everything under the sun. Under yeah, so I think God, God has been uh, overseeing um, uh, the unfolding of history. So uh, with Martini, um, all these Italian duchies, I don't know how many there were, John Luca, but there was, it looked like there were dozens of them, uh, little duchies. And then Martini came and united all of Italy. And then over in Germany, uh, Frederick Bismarck, the Great. With Bismarck. Bis also, yeah, Frederick the Great, Bismarck in 1871, and then Kaiser Wilhelm in World War One. Yeah. So there was this impetus, uh, and then uh, Nazi Germany trying to unite the world under Pax Germanica. So, right. uh, and then the Brits trying to unite the world under Pax Britannia. With, they said, we are in a quarter of the world. We might as well wrap it all up here. And God says, you've forgotten me. And Rud me. Yeah. yeah, Rudyard Kipling wrote a warning to the British uh, uh, Empire, uh, the British um, Commonwealth, um, lest we forget, you know, and it was not lest we forget our dead soldiers, it was lest we forget our God, but later on it was switched to lest we, get, we forget our dead soldiers. But why did we lose so many soldiers? Because we, we wanted to fight amongst each other rather mm -hmm. than coming to God. And so... Mm -hmm all these European nations were being united. Germany was being united, um, um, Italy, France. And then we ended up with the, 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 um, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance with United with two big armed camps in Europe that were all ready to go to war in World War I with just one spark. And that's what happened. It was a terrible war. God would not allow the Germans the German lines to be broken through. Uh, we fought against, we, we, we were banging against that, the German lines for, from 1914 to 1918, and we never really broke through. Uh, God would, because God is in Germany, God, if, if European nations, let's assume that they might be <clears throat> sparks of the lost 10 tribes. If one is fighting against another, whose side is God going to be on? Yeah. I don't think God is on, going to be on, on either side, except yeah. when one gets to be more evil than the other, as happened in Nazi Germany, of course. Uh, but, the, um, but after that, God's heart is still for his people. And the, after the war, after World War II, they tried to unite all these European nations under the uh, common market and the European Union. And look what's happening today. The whole thing's starting to fall to pieces. They even tried to have a, a single uniting language, Esperanza, that would unite all of Europe. How far did that go? Yeah. It, I mean, God has established these sparks, these jewels in his treasure chest, 
and they're all individual sparks and they reflect the light in wonderful ways. So this unification thing is going to run up against, um, against the God of Israel. Because the real one. Israel. And yeah. it looks like we are all in a valley of decision. Yeah, uh, every, absolutely. Yeah. And there, I, I see here, we see here together, Gavin, you and I, like a crescendo leading up to the final decision and to the mm. final destination. Yes. Uh, where do we stand? But I think that we all made uh, our decision long ago. <laughs> we stand for yeah. truth. We yes. stand for the word of God. We stand for, uh, for, for the Lord, for Jesus. Now, the epicenter of all Bible prophecy, mm. it's going to be Israel. Determine now before progressing on towards the prophetic sequence of the events, many are denying even the materiality of Israel. And mm. it's really bad because yeah. doing so, they are, I believe, proclaiming sort of like a, a gnostic belief that <clears throat> says that the physical world or the materiality is somehow irrelevant and consequently. Mm -hmm. You know, people are rejecting even the second coming of, of Jesus in glory, who shall come out of where? Out of the U.S., out of Italy? No, out of Zion. Mm -hmm. So um, those that are denying the materiality of Israel, they are not believing the declaration of God's word. Mm -hmm. So by rejecting the physicality of Israel, of the promised land given to a specific people, that's a most subtle trick of the enemy, I believe. Yes, and then yeah. there's the issue of the holy place too, uh, John Luca. Remember okay. way back in, with Abraham, uh, God, God was showing Abraham, this is the place here. In other words, uh, I, I have established my purposes here. And even though all the nations will come against it at the close of the age to try to take it over, to hijack it, to shut it out, uh, they will not, not. They will not succeed, and that's the drama of the the ultimate um, yes. conclusion to the conflict at the Battle of Armageddon at the very end. Oh. oh yes, yes. Having you know, having people denigrated this, it's like uh, you know, declaring that God's word is not true when it says that God has, for example, look at here in Zechariah seven. It, it is him that says, yes, I have scattered them with the whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. Uh, and I am zealous for Zion with great zeal, with great fervor. I am zealous for her. And look at this. He says, I will save my people from where? From the land of the east and from the land of the west. And I will bring them back to where? To a land with borders, to a, to a specific and particular land. So here we see the almighty's choice of Eretz Israel, which is mm. without dispute to me. I mm. mean, it's this is God's commitment to bring mm. uh, the house of Jacob back as he has sent them apart, also set them apart to be a witness and mm. a testimony to all the nations. Yeah, this is the happy truth here, John Luca, uh, the bright and shining future that we have to mm. return to Jerusalem. But it's interesting that um, he leaves out a little bit in the middle where, you know, it's just like a father saying, you're coming back home, but you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to focus on the fact that I had to correct you on the way <laughs> or looking at the, the, looking at the mystery of Bosra story or the, or the issue of I'm going to hunt you down. Uh, the day will come when the work of the fishes will, will cease and I will send the hunters to hunt you down from, <laughs> from every nook and cranny all around the world. I'm, I'm, I'm coming for you and I'm yes, hunting you down. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, God has omitted that part of the story in this, in this scripture. And he's saying, look, I'm bringing you all the way back to Jerusalem. And he's not, he's not telling the details in the middle because he wants to, us to focus on the happy ending of the story, which is very wonderful. Which, which entails also powerful testimony, powerful witness of Jacob, of the house of Jacob, yeah. that, you know, the rolling on the ground, the transformation, yeah. we saw it uh, in a couple of sessions before, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Jacob is uh, wrestling, you know, with becoming, God. wrestling with <laughs> God, he's becoming <laughs> Israel by and by, because he has got a prophetic engagement that starts yes. starts when they are regathered to the land. You know, yes. I believe that without Israel in the land, there cannot be a powerful testimony no, no. Uh, to the powers of the earth. The church no. is called to 
uh, to bear a powerful testimony uh, to the power to the powers of heaven. And Israel at the same time is a, a witness and a testimony that there is a God in heaven whose name is the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Yes. And yes. so, and, and even, you know, Messiah couldn't come without every gathered people. And it's yes. God that says, I will return to where? To Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. God says, I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. This is when the deliverer shall come out of Zion. You know, that's the physicality of the of the promises of God, right? Mm. And he will turn away ungodliness for Jacob, for this is my covenant with them, when I will take away their sins and all Israel, we know what it is, uh, shall be saved. And uh, look at Obadiah 17. But on Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. On Mount Zion, precisely, a spot, a location. So... Uh, according to the leading up to Yeshua, which is the culmination of the pilgrimage, which starts with Aliyah to the land, the regathering and unbelief, then they are, go, they are going back to Torah, they are turning to God by means of Teshuah. Now they are uh, having the unveiling of Joseph, you know, the brother and Yeshua. This mm -hmm. implies a detailed prophetic timeline. Absolutely. <laughs> through the radical transformation mm -hmm. uh, coming from being a supplanter to the one who struggles with God, the prince with God, the one who was make from crude, crooked is made to, you know, like even. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's receiving a new, a new name despite yes. all the struggles and the wrestlings. Yeah, he's, uh, Jacob has a nurturing spirit to him, which God says, I can deal with that man, you know. Yes. Uh, Esau, Esau, he was a take you down hustler sort of a guy. Uh, and God wants to draw people out of that realm of the Edomites to himself as well. Um, so as he did with Obed-Edom, you know, <laughs> he gave them the custody of the, of the Ark of the Covenant for a while. Uh, so we've got, we've got a wonderful regathering plan of God in which uh, yeah. he, he says, look, uh, you, you, you people, um, particularly the house of Israel, uh, that are hidden in the nations. You're sitting there, you're blessed, and you've got everything wrapped up. You, you, you think you've got the world uh, <clears throat> by the collar and you've, you're in control of everything, but you're not really, because yeah. you're, you're running into tremend tremendous sovereign debt. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to scatter you one last time uh, so that you can, you can bring the gospel out beyond your little religious enclave in which you are blessed and, and realize that you've got a greater calling on you other than to accumulate wealth and power and, and, and self-worth and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you're going to find your glory in me, not in yourself. You're going to find your esteem, not in self-esteem, but to be esteemed in my service, uh, in my glory, in my, in my esteem. So God is drawing his people to a deeper walk and they may have to come uh, with a little bit of uh, persuasion, but yes. uh, they will come, the ones that are going to come, and the ones that will get offended by that will fall away. So we, we've got to at least let people know that there will be a challenge and there'll be a, there will be a, a come to Jesus meeting in which people can say, I'm going to come, I'm going to repent, I'm going to let's blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain, Come to Yeshua. Let the priests and the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. Porch this the is altar. this is this is Jacob yeah. repenting, uh, and others will be offended by all that, and they will go with the um, tissue of lies. The uh, who are, uh, to the new world order, which uh, has uh, which has rejected the God of Israel and has installed self upon the altar, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is the, the spirit of Lucifer, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the big decision time. Big decision time. Yeah. I mean, our question, Gavin, need to be: uh, What might be the trigger events that would give way to this final countdown to the unveiling uh, of Yeshua, to the final mm -hmm. salvation of the House of Judah, and uh, in which there is this corporate witnessing about, uh, you know, who we are in the Lord. We uh, called from among the nations and uh, 
the royal house of Judah called to be a powerful witness in the mm-hmm. earth, despite all the struggles and the wrestling of, uh, mm-hmm. of Jacob. So what might be one of the final trigger events that would ignite like this entrance into the final phase of uh, the present age, uh, which uh, we can say the, 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 the 70th week of Daniel, like. Ah, uh, now you're getting right down to it, John Luca. Yeah. Uh, the 70th week of Daniel. Thank God for um, Sir Robert Anderson, who wrote the book, um, The Coming Prince, back in the late 19th century. He laid out the 70 weeks prophecy very wonderfully and showed the 69 weeks uh, were fulfilled with the first coming of Messiah, and, and there's, a, he, there's, a, there's a future 70th week out there. We've yeah, got to look he, at it. He was a he was the forerunner uh, in understanding no the, yes. the prophetic sequence of the events uh, entering into it. Then other other came, uh, and uh, we know also that our dear friend Doc Krieger, he mm. made very good commentaries on that. You as well, and and some others. There are, I believe, that scholars would agree here. Uh, all of the scholars uh, uh, that Zechariah 9 and uh, Isaiah 17 would uh, mark a certain point in future yes. time uh, whereby something happens that would ignite and favor, uh, let's say, the, the countdown to uh, the revealing of Yeshua uh, yes. at the end and yes. the end of it. There, there is a trigger that could I- initiate the messianic scenario, like for for instance, uh, the peace of treaty, the most welcomed but deceitful covenant with death, agreement with Sheol or hell, according to Isaiah twenty eight fifteen. I think the passage says, because you have said we have made a covenant and agreement with death, and and hell. Uh, which will be, we know, uh, an agreement between the Antichrist, the, this world leadership with also Israel con- consent. Now, mm. the Hebrew prophets, they have pointed out this particular uh, uh, scenario res- resulting in a, a specific event in the future. Mm. We know that Damascus, who is the capital of Syria, uh, I think it's uh, uh, one of the most ancient cities, continuous cities, which have never been destroyed. That's right. It's it been there. there. It's been there all along, John Luca. But here all it along. is. We see we see a prophecy in which it will be destroyed uh, and become a, a ruinous heap. That's never happened before. Never happened before, and it, it says the Bible that we will will cease from being a city. What does it mean? We need to take it absolutely here in the literal sense. And I believe that it's very probable that Israel shall be, uh, let's say, victorious at the end of, uh, it comes to mind, uh, Daniel 9, when he says that there will be be war till the very end. Uh, Oh, I see. Some argue and say that these, there will be war till the end. They take uh, the whole uh, Arab-Israeli war since 1948, that at the very end there will be like seven wars. And, uh, but at the very end, uh, Israel shall be like greatly diminished in their capacity mm. to wage war. Look at this passage. This is taken from the New yes. American Standard Bible because it mm. renders very well that in that day, it means in that period of prophetic history, the glory of Jacob will fade. Another yeah. translation says will wane. Which we've fact- got a. Oh, sorry, Jim. Yeah, no, go please ahead. go ahead. Please, please uh, go ahead. The, the the thing is that we're realizing now that uh, that is not just the Jewish house. That's yeah. the lost house, which is hidden in. Uh, it's been uh, uh, scattered and hidden in the nations, but quite well, I believe, very obviously recrystallized again in certain geographical places oh, on yeah. the planet, um, <laughs> like in the West, maybe. Uh, and so so it's, this people are inclined to say, oh, well, it looks like rough times ahead for the Jews, right, in, in Israel. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a bigger story than that, obviously. Yeah. And uh, we, because it says that the fortress uh, will go, I think, in the same 
Yes, they're yeah. just there. You've the fortress got a, of Ephraim. The fortress of, we'll see. Of so if, if Ephraim represents the West and maybe a, the, the last superpower of the West, then um, their superpower status militarily will uh, will be given to some other entity and they will lose yeah. it uh, as it being a personal thing for them. Yeah. So. But, but also at the very end, of the story at the end of the day, I believe that that Oracle of Damascus will be waged uh, in the land of Israel. And also mm. these, um, I think we, we might have also an, an adumbrative language as you, I think you were, you wanted to uh, to convey that, you know, fortress or be frame represents, you know, something even beyond the, 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 the borders of Israel. But uh, yes. there are many scholars that they also see the physicalities of this, like the cities of Arur. Mm -hmm. It's the land east of the Jordan River, the fortress of Refrain, it's really Ramallah, the Palestinian Authority in Samaria. Damascus, of course, it's is a city in, in Syria. We have mm -hmm. Tyre and Sidon in Lebanon. This is a, a mix in between uh, Zechariah 9 and uh, mm -hmm. Isaiah 7. And then we have Ashkelon, which are Gaza, uh, Ashdod, the Philistines, which, which mm. are the cities and the area south of Israel and uh, literally uh, ancient Philistia. Well, you know, there's a, a, a mix uh, going on here, uh, but our focus today is on the progressive sequence of these prophetic events that would bring yeah. then Jacob to this final transformation. Yeah, this, uh, this war, this war yeah. of... Um... Uh, which sees the destruction of Damascus would would probably terrify the whole world, because uh, if if Damascus is placed so close to Israel yeah. that they can arm it with um, supersonic missiles, and they look like they're threatening to send those birds out towards Israel, absolutely, Israel Israel will have no other option but to clobber it in a decisive way. And that would bring in the uh, destruction of Damascus, in which the whole world will just be in up in arms, saying, "Oh, you've Israel, you have overstepped. You have made a, a what's the word, an unbalanced response, or something like that." Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to need to bring in uh, th this whole situation has got to be brought to a stop. I mean, this is going to destroy the world. We've got to bring in a new world order that that yes. will fulfill what Peter, Paul and Mary says, you know, um, how many times would a cannonball fly before they're forever banned? Yes. World disarmament. We need to disarm the world of all these weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons. Somebody's got to do that. Who will do that? Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's when you've got your, um, your mega dealer, your peacemaking uh, um, man coming to the front. So, and yeah, then he, yeah, yeah signing this infamous agreement with death and hell mm -hmm. you're, you're you're spot on and you know in israel they they've got what they call the 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 samson option which yeah. is the legitimate defense before dying you know when when at the end of his no life, longer no Solomon. longer masada remember that yeah. no longer masada yeah in other words that was a terrible thing uh that they said never again we're not going to ever allow that to happen to us ever again Yes. So there's your Samson option in which, look, if you come at us, we're going to bring the whole world down. So so that is going to mean that the world is going to be screaming for a new world order to disarm the world of all these nukes and also to ensure peace and safety. And they will say, look, um, we know that uh, they'll say to the powers of darkness, we know that you're against this God of Israel. Uh, but we are no longer with that God of Israel. Um, we're going to make a deal with you. And um, so that this death issue is not going to come near us. Uh, we're gonna, we'll make a covenant with death and make lies our covering. And we'll forget our God. And uh, in doing so, we will, uh, we will uh, prevent ourselves from getting hurt. Yes. Not correct. So, uh, it Correct. won't work. It, it won't work because God says it won't work. He says you, you've made this deal, and you think it's going to work. You, you've made a deal with a bad guy, or you know, like Goma. You've made your ultimate um, 
uh, you've gone to bed with the ultimate lover who is the ultimate bad guy and you think that you're safe with the ultimate bad guy. Okay. <laughs> Let's see how that plays out. Yeah. Spot on. Spot on. There will be this enforcement of the pact of the, some they say a defense pact and a defense agreement. I believe that such an accord will actually be uh, the affirmation of even pre-existing agreements, much like the strong bond in existence today between yeah. Israel and the United States, various presidents, they have, they have worked in favor of that, uh, let, an, let alone Donald Trump with the moving of the embassy, you know, they're mm. reinforcing the, the covenant. I remember under Obama, they did the, the, the famous unbreakable alliance, you know, mm. these- and the Oslo they, they Accords all... and, the, uh, and the Camp yes. David, <laughs> there's been attempts to sort of bring peace to the Middle East and, and Israel and the US, um, you know, if they are due to Ephraim, they have been wanting to do things in political carnal ways without Messiah. And they will probably continue to do so uh, even to the point of this covenant with death, because it says it's a covenant with many uh, um, in Daniel 9.27. Uh, they will make a covenant with many for one week or one seven year period. So uh, they'll yeah. say, look, um, just, just let me share cover sovereignty with you for seven years. I will provide peace. We will disarm yeah. the nations. We'll bring in a new world order. We'll divide the world up into 10 geopolitical regions, which we already have in economic uh, trade zones already. And uh, we will uh, bring the peace without this God of Israel that is so nasty. You know, the, uh, they talk about white privilege or, or the European scourge, you know, we're the bad guys, you know, the Judeo-Christian people are the, are the bad guys in this new world order conversation. Uh, any pagan is good, but anybody yeah. that relates to the Judeo-Christian people, they're bad. So, so you can understand why that's happening. They're trying to pressure us to make a deal, this covenant with death. Yeah, sometimes it starts with having... Uh... I think that we had a conversation uh, privately uh, the other day. We were commenting on this uh, green horse <laughs> of revelation, even though yeah. it doesn't exist. You know, it, it, starts, it starts just by this social control, uh, this implementation of these draconian laws. Yes, uh, yeah, that that's right. Without which you cannot travel, without which you cannot uh you cannot do almost anything can you just mm. imagine uh yeah. what green, will be in the future the green the green passport right green and, passport and, and and the pale horse rider is the fourth of the four horsemen and it's not really pale in greek it's chloros it is yes which is green right you, you know you're green. greek you know your greek and hebrew uh, john luca Chloros, you know, from where we get chlorophyll is green. So it's a green horse. If you, ask a, horse, yeah. if you ask a horseman, what is a green horse? He'll say a wild horse. So, yeah. um, you know, we're looking at some wild stuff going on here. No question Very about wild. it. Very wild. And yeah. the, the, the end uh, has not yet come here with uh, uh, our dealing with uh, even the Damascus, because I would like to bring forward the conversation by looking into the the next loop in the sequence of events, because we know that the end will not come. There will be, not yet, not yet, there will be this um, infamous agreement with, uh, with death, with Sheol, with, uh, with hell, that could even spark and, 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 and trigger a, a, a conflict of wider proportion than Damascus. I'm referring to the Gog and Magog. There's so much commented everywhere. We don't have to speculate here. I think people almost know everybody about this. We are all scholars, so you know, from various parts are coming to an agreement um, to say that it will be a future massive war. The Bible says, after many days, you will be visited, Ezekiel 38, 8, in the latter days, you will come into the land, and it will be at the time when the house of Jacob is regathered. Uh, this is a common ground, and dwell safely in the land. We read here, in the latter days, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered 
from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them are dwelling safely. Now, the point is, this is Israel, the unwalled nation. Uh, um, I mean, Ezekiel 38, 11, uh, it says that you will say it will go up against the land of unwalled village, villages. Uh, you know, these unwalled villages dwelling without walls, having no bars, no gates. I think it depicts a situation of complete quietness or security in the land, peace, the mm. time when Israel will have perhaps gained more security. I don't know, I'm just speculating, but mm. uh, I think that everything is coming toward what uh, Caroline Gleick said in this wonderful book, which I'm recommending to read, the one stage solution, which is the, the Israeli solution. It's, it's coming soon. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, one of these days, uh, Israel will have to decide, you know, uh, about annexations or parts, uh, part of lands that were uh, maybe promised with the the previous um, American administration, so on and so forth. Well, everything is just to say that in the very uh, end of days, you know, it's the glory of Jacob will wane and the fatness as we have read in Isaiah 74. Uh, and the, the fatness of the flesh will, uh, mm. will grow lean. And here we have the Gog and Magog war that perhaps is ignited by a principality over the region, the entire region called Gog, which is the chief principality of Ezekiel 38, three, over the spiritual powers of Magog, which are the allies of God and that will provoke and influence nations surrounding Israel. We've got a plethora of nations here from the north to the south you know, coming against Israel in these uh, last days. Now, we don't want to speculate. We don't want to go into details. We could take time and uh, dissect uh, all these Meshach, Tubal, and Gomer. Uh, mm -hmm. They represent Turkey. Then we have Iran, Persia. And we have Kush, which is ancient Ethiopia. Uh, the land between the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, ancient Assyria, North Iraq. You know, many nations will come uh, against Israel from the north and from, from the south, including Egypt, North Africa, the Islamic states, uh, Put or Libya, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Sudan. You know, all to say that it will be a massive conflagration that the Bible says in, in Ezekiel 39, 12, we have here, that even for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. And uh, here is the point of major, uh, let's say also, also weakness in the flesh where the Lord himself will intervene miraculously to defend his people in the land of Israel, will destroy the opposing forces, the power of God, the principality. And um, this is a long passage in, in Ezekiel 39 and, uh, uh, and I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. And then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is, Gavin, the opening of, of a total new chapter in the history of his people. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not lem, let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. I think it will be a trigger for an incredible spiritual awakening in the house of Judah, where God's spirit will begin to move upon the remnant of Israel as a result of his mighty intervention on Israel behalf. All the nation will see it. Uh, I think that also... Prior to that, it's in the context of Isaiah 17, the Oracle of Damascus. There's a passage I have here in my Bible, Isaiah 17, 7. In that day, a man will look to his maker and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. This is the beginning of revival, not only in Israel, but also in all the nations surrounding yes. Israel. 
uh, is not only for Israel, but it's for all the nations, because it says that uh, a man, you know, the, 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 the creator, the creature, sorry, the, the man will look to his maker. This is a personal relationship from man man to God. And yeah, yeah. It, it, the Lord is, will use this incredible suffering uh, because of devastation, incredible devastation, incredible scattering. But God is into salvation here. He will start bringing revival, saving even in the nation surrounding Israel. But here, specifically, in the Gog of post Gog of Magog were the Lord will show himself great once again as in the days of old, says the Bible. God will intervene, will save his people, and from, from that day on, they shall know on a corporate level that God is the Lord, he is in uh, on their behalf. Look at this Isaiah 44, 2 and 3. I believe that it offers a picture of these last days out, outpouring upon the house of Jacob. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, pretty much uh, matches with uh, uh, Zechariah 12 that mm -hmm. you many times have shared during our Bible studies. Uh, Thus says the Lord, fear not, O Jacob, my servant, you, Yeshurun, which is a synonym, uh, it's a poetical form for Israel whom I have chosen for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Well, I think that this describes a revival of the spirit of God descending like streams and floods. And, uh, you know, it's during this time that the revival will break out in both houses, the house of Judah and uh, among the Gentiles. At the same time, we will be in the final seven years in the uh, apocalypse, in the unveiling, in the revelation of all things, where we will know uh, much more. We will understand many things because revelation is really revealing the unveiling of things. Mm -hmm. And so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. I'm really excited here. Because in the Hebrew the Bible, in the original, this verb shall know means to properly uh, ascertain by seeing. You know, mm -hmm. I ascertain a thing when I see a thing. In other words, on the heels of God's incredible intervention here, Israel will begin to experience God's favor. It will, uh, you know, experience God's help for having seen him in action on their behalf as never before, perhaps, or as in the days of, you know, of the past uh, of, of the Bible. And um, mm. it will be manifest at the same time in the nations as a powerful witness uh, to God's everlasting purposes on behalf of his people. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we will see in the near, near future. Once again, Ezekiel 39, therefore says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. Mm -hmm. Well, it is like God says, now I will bring back the remnant of Jacob. I will bring them back physically speaking for those that will make Aliyah, for those that will decide to make this ascent, but also there will be uh, this ascent from the physical to the spiritual. It's yes. going to be a restoration of massive proportion mm -hmm. at the end of days. Mm -hmm. This is the point, I believe, in the prophetic sequence of the events from which I believe and expect to see the one of the greatest mass movement of return to the land of Israel ever since the creation of the state of Israel. Then... Is incredible. They shall know that I am the Lord, the God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. Mm -hmm. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out what? My spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. Yes. This is uh, worthy of note. We got to ponder these words because 
uh, is going to be the reality for the future. But once again, God wants to remind us that God says, I want to sanctify all, as it says here, I will show the holiness of my name. Mm. I will do it for my name's sake. It's like God is saying, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. So um, uh, helping the Jewish people coming home and uh, uh, positioning them to receive their, uh, the revelation of, you know, of, of Yeshua is equal to saying, O oh Lord, uh, let your name be hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. It's going to be for the for the glorification of God's name. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I and it will be known in the eyes of in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. It's about knowing the Lord by seeing His intervening in Israel, by seeing Him uh, sparking revivals all over, all over, all over the world, and uh, once again. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Hmm. That's going to be a wonderful wrap up at the end, John Luca, and a great, the great revival that Joel promised in uh, Joel 2. Uh, yes, indeed. Pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And uh, uh, there will be people. There will be people saved from one end of the planet to the other. And it's the intention of God right at the beginning that uh, they would come to him first as, as repenting sinners, then as servants, and then as friends. That was the sequence that he called uh, Abraham his friend. God wow. called Abraham his friend because Abraham was willing to go the whole distance with, with him. And uh, that's the calling that God has upon us today. To and may go, the Lord help us to yeah. walk the extra mile yes. to reach the final destination. We yeah. all have a, a telos, an end, uh, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. Never forget mm. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, sequence that you've laid out there, John Luca. And... Uh, very hopeful as well, uh, even even in the promise that uh, God will be a deliverer uh, and he will come to set the captives free. Uh, well, and also to um, bring people back from the land uh, of their um, sojourn among the nations to bring them into his holy city yes. in which they will no longer be Gentiles. They will be his covenant people, uh, the congregation and the commonwealth of Israel. God only ever called one nation to himself uh, to, for salvation. And his message goes out to all the nations to, um, to come to him and uh, find redemption. And at the close of the age, yes. del deliverance as well. So uh, some, some drama there. <laughs> some um, adventures, some romance at the close of the age, and uh, also some great glory as well. So we will see. We yeah. will see. Amen. Yeah. Amen to that. Great, John Luca. Well, shall we close with a prayer? And uh, absolutely, yes. Okay, I'll pray, and then you pray. Okay, Lord, we bring our allegiance to you father as you are the king that wraps things up at the close of the age you're the ultimate sovereign you've uh, taken us out amongst the nations and we gave our allegiance to the princes and they uh, gave varying degrees of support to us lord but as we come to the close of the age we see that there are no other options but to turn to you father and that there are no other um, solutions politically for us in the uh, the order that is to come and that uh, the powers will be forgetting you and encouraging us to do the same. But Lord, uh, you have called us to remember you and in the sequence of events to remember, to repent, and then to be reunited 
and then to be restored and then to return to Jerusalem, uh, to the great party at the close of the age. Thank you, Father, for your plans that's, that are laid out that are so wonderful. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen to that. Allah. Mm. Lord, we thank you because we can realize that with you, all things are possible. So we yeah. ask uh, to give us the courage to go to the very end, to walk the extra mile in order to fulfill your purposes on earth. Above all, help us to believe in the word of God, in the prophetic declaration of the truth, which is absolutely infallible, O Lord. You said, uh, behold, I've told you everything uh, in advance so that we need to prepare we need to prepare mentally speaking spiritually speaking and also at times physically speaking to be able to stand in the days of our final testimonies in the last days oh mm -hmm. thank you lord because you love your people wherever they are um, uh, in, in the nation so god you are preparing uh, your bride uh, we are making ourselves ready to meet you in the very end help us to stay alongside the the house of judah as they go uh, in their uh, transformation from jacob into israel help us oh god to to realize of your purposes for them, of the in gathering from the nations, and also of their final salvation. Thank you, Lord. We want to uh, speak a prayer of blessing over all the viewers of these sessions. Uh, may uh, they profit from what they've heard. May you bless all the congregations in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. That's great, John Luca. Great. Looking forward cool. to number twelve. Uh, there's more to discuss next time. Oh, uh, there's the some there's some wonderful promises at the very end, isn't there? And yeah. uh, it, it, it helps to uh, help us understand how it's going to happen because we are inclined to say, "How on earth is God going to bring anything good and redemptive out of all this mess at the close of the age?" People say, "Oh, it's a chamber of horrors. We can't be there. Look, forget no. it." Uh, God has made provision. Um, and what's more, he has his agenda in all that goes on. He controls the chessboard, and at the very end, he's the one who says to the devil, checkmate. Checkmate, yeah. So that's good to know. God is a righteous God as well as a God of salvation, grace, and mercy. So uh, he's got these two offices, and we, uh, we are privileged to be a part of, of all that. So yes, we are. that's good. Mm -hmm. Well... Until next time, Gianluca, Godspeed to you and blessings. Thank, Thank you, you so much for presenting this um, wonderful uh, storyline here, which is coming towards a, a glorious conclusion. So, nice to you, Gavin. I couldn't do it without you. Thank you and shalom. Shalom to all. <laughs>